This is the United Podcast Network. Welcome to Spouses Talking Houses with husband and wife real estate team Jennifer and Brian Frost. Everything you want to know about buying, selling, investing, and owning property. So let's get real about real estate. Welcome back to Spouses Talking Houses. I'm Jennifer. I'm Brian. And today our guest is Chris Pryor, Chris Pryor from EnviroVantage. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. How are you? Um, and he is going to talk with us about water damage, handling that in your house, and mold, mold prevention and mold remediation. Um, I know that sounds fascinating, <laughs> <laughs> but we, we run into it quite a bit. Sure. Yeah, we run into it quite a bit. It's it's getting to be as common in houses as the common cold is. Sure, I'm, I'm always have my fingers crossed when uh, the inspector goes up into the attic. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and we're we're getting into the winter time here too. Uh, as a matter of fact, resuming because it's a nice snowy day outside. Um, but you know, I start to worry about freeze ups in the houses as well. Sure, especially the vacant ones. Yeah, I'm sitting there. For- yeah, exactly, exactly. So um, before we jump into getting real about water damage and mold treatment, just wanted to talk a little bit about the realtor lifestyle. Um, my proud accomplishment is I got a poodle mug. <laughs> Poor Brian. And um, and our daughter, Casey, watched, uh, watched a, an episode of The Chef Show all about meatballs and made us an amazing meal last night. It was delicious. Yeah, and the house smelled smelled fantastic. Um, Chris, what what are you up to in your non um, hazardous treatment time? So I have a seven year old who is uh, has been remote learning uh, since the beginning of the school year, and uh, thankfully there's a YMCA program where he spends most of his time. But one of the parents of one of the children tested positive, so he's in kind of. Uh, He's at the tail end, actually, last day of a of a quarantine, a but quarantine. everyone's been safe. Um, yeah. So the house is a little chaotic today, <laughs> and and whatnot. Let's see, September, October, November. That's that's a long time of being cooped up. This is true. And I I can't even sit still for an hour long Zoom meeting. <laughs> and I'm theoretically an adult. And not a seven-year-old boy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Today's a little stir crazy, but uh, we'll we'll go outside once uh, the snow winds down. Do some shoveling right on the tractor, and maybe nice. go over and see some friends that have some snowmobiles. That's cool. awesome. That's great. So, Chris, tell us a little bit about Enviro Vantage and what you do there. Sure. So uh, the company is headquartered in Epping, New Hampshire. Uh, we've been in business for. 35 years. We have offices not only in New Hampshire, but up in the Portland, Maine area, uh, just outside of Boston in Stoneham, Massachusetts. We've got an office in Maryland as well. And uh, we handle everything from residential mold remediation all the way up to full building takedowns. So uh, essentially what I tell folks is if it requires a white suit and a respirator, the chances are quite high that uh, EnviroVantage will handle it. Yeah, and, and as you're far as always... my role there, okay. uh, I, I'm the vice president of indoor air quality. So, essentially, anything uh, when it comes to a home that would disrupt someone's uh, ability to breathe or have, have trouble breathing, that's uh, where my specialty lies. So, do you use a, like a HEPA filter or something like that in your own home? I actually don't have uh, any HEPA filtration in my home. It's, uh, you know, every, everyone interacts with any allergen uh, differently. So thankfully, myself and my family, we all have a pretty good immune system. So uh, it's more about just making sure that the environment uh, stays clean, you know, limited, limited dust and so forth. And uh, you should should be fine. All right. Excellent. Well, you're always my first call when uh, somebody needs to have mold remediated or we've got a question about asbestos or that type of thing. Um, But let's start with with water damage, you know, a pipe burst, a roof leaks, um, sprinkler systems go off. I mean, there's a lot of different circumstances where a house can get wet. 
Yeah. And even uh, with the snow that's going on right now, soon, uh, it, you know, we're, we're entering winter and uh, you're going to see the formation of ice dams as well and the water intrusion associated with that. And I know Brian had mentioned, um, you know, the, the, the fear of a home inspector going into an attic and, and seeing mold. And, you know, that's some one of the first things that when we do get the call and we go out and visit the home is we want to diagnose if we can why the mold is occurring and um so you know getting information about has there been a history of of ice damming uh any other sort of water related issues but um let's talk about water damage how can i help yeah well speaking of ice dams i hear differing opinions about roof raking having those ice melt uh little electrical lines right at the right at the roof line gutters you know what what's the prevention for ice dams if there is any i mean we have yeah. we have a finished cathedral ceiling so i don't have any air pocket in between so we mm -hmm. are susceptible to them in the room that we're in right now okay so first and foremost if you do have the opportunity to vent the the roof the goal is to keep the roof deck, the wood that comprises the, the roof, as close to ambient air temperature as possible. Because if you're able to do that, then the snow theoretically will stay on the, the roof um, until the entire system warms up and the, the water can, can drip off the roof. Uh, where you'll see the biggest problem is heat loss in the home, making its way up into the attic. Uh, that that air and, to, and heat will stall. It will melt the snow up high. The water runs down to the eave edge. And if it's 20 degrees or 10 degrees outside, it's going to refreeze because that overhang is always ambient air temperature. And that's where you get the backup of ice. Now, you asked the question about uh, roof raking. Um, the potential there is that you cause an ice dam higher than ice and water shield if it was installed on your roof. Okay. Um, but the wires actually would be beneficial because they, in essence, will create a pathway for any water that's uh, stalling behind an ice dam to make its way off the roof. So I would favor that uh, over uh, roof raking. Um, but first and foremost, I would say if there's the opportunity to ventilate the roof appropriately so that you're not getting the accumulation of excess heat uh, in those rafter bays, you'll be better off. So a good warning sign of an ice dam maybe about to form is when you have the long icicles hanging from your drip edge. Definitely. On the eve of your roof. Definitely. And is there anything you can do at that point? Uh in that case, I suppose roof raking, you know, getting off the material that has the, the potential to melt higher and cause a problem uh, is your only option. Okay. All right. Now, when you guys get called for a, a soggy house, uh, what are typically the reasons why people end up with, um, with water damage? It truly varies. It can be anything from a... Uh, sewer backup, which no one really likes to talk about, Ugh. to um, a cold temperature pipe freeze, you know, maybe a house is bank owned and the oil didn't get filled and the pipes freeze and water runs for days. Um, you can have a, a dishwasher hose let go or the fill for a, a toilet. Um, Really, anywhere that water is flowing through the house uh, is is susceptible to a potential failure or you know, if there's a massive rainstorm and water comes in. Um, the key really in, in any water event is uh, how quickly you're able to dry the structure. Um, I've seen homes in which um, there was a water event uh, actually, this was an, an ice damming event, and so water was leaking in through the attic. The homeowner uh, noticed the discoloration uh, in the bedroom ceiling. He ran up into the attic, um, pulled up the insulation that was all wet and soggy and bagged it, 
put a fan in the attic and one in the bedroom and dried the drywall in in under a day. So uh, no potential for mold formation in a case like that. It was, uh, he did a good job of, of drying the structure quickly. We had a client about a month, maybe six weeks ago, come home from work to water pouring down their driveway um, because of a, a, a pipe that had let go from an upstairs bathroom. And so it made its way into the upstairs bedrooms, through the ceiling of the family room in the kitchen, and then down into the garage and out the driveway. Um, you know, they did they did call their insurance company and have somebody come over right away, you know, with the fans and, and all of that. Um, and they and they said the same thing. If you can dry it quickly, it doesn't have enough time to start a mold situation. That's correct. Uh, regardless, what you just described is going to be a very disruptive situation for that family, regardless, because depending on the types of finished flooring they have, perhaps carpet could just simply be pulled up and dried underneath. But if they have uh, a hardwood floor, um, you can't really dry through hardwood. So you've got to get down to the uh, original subfloor material and, uh, and, and do drying that way. Yeah, the carpet, of course, was very, very recent because they were getting ready to put the house on the market. So, <laughs> of course, <laughs> why couldn't that have happened before? I mean, let the insurance company pay for those improvements. Right? Exactly, exactly. So, um, so, so, what what do you do when you come in to to dry out a house? Uh, first thing that you really have to do is, you know, find the source of the water. Hopefully, that's that's been shut off before we arrive. And then it's a matter of uh, doing something called moisture mapping, which is you figure out where the water went, um, what the level of wetness is in the various building materials, and then come up with the strategy to dry. Um, because again, mold is the biggest uh, enemy at, at this point in time. So it could be uh, as simple as removing some a baseboard throughout the house and drilling some holes um, and inserting uh, air into the back side of the wall cavity so you can dry both sides uh, okay. of the wall. Yes. Yeah. Um, if it's lost structural integrity, that being the, the drywall, then uh, it would need to be cut out. Same thing with the insulation. It may have lost its R value. So really, you, if you have someone that's competent, uh, on staff and, and can get out there and understand where the water would have migrated and come up with a good solution to dry it quickly. Um, it really is just an unfortunate incident that occurred, but doesn't lead to any long-term problems. So you guys have a, a 24-7 um, service. You're, you're able to get crews out there right away? We used to. Um, we've gotten to the point uh, where business is good. And so now the projects that, that we focus on relate more to um, indoor air quality issues as opposed to emergency response. So my pipes just burst. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but we're, we're happy to, to talk with everyone and make sure that they're getting the level of service that they, they need and deserve. And we, Brian and I were talking recently about those um, water, what are those moisture Alarms? Oh, right. The, uh, yeah, an alarm that you place near your hot water tank or, you know, yeah, some similar appliance. Yep. Yes, yeah, so you can have it for your, you know, near your fridge for your ice maker, near your washing machine, near your hot water heater, maybe even if you want to at some of your sinks. And um, how does it tell you if, if you've got water? It, it makes a sound. It's an alarm. Okay. All right. Yeah. And they're not very expensive. No, but most of the ones you see are battery operated. So, of course, you got to make sure the batteries are uh, changed or else it's not going to help you much. Right. And I think that some of the newer ones that I have seen, you know, they call it the Internet of Things. Um, basically, like your Nest um, whole oh, right. system there can also be connected. So, you know, if you're away on vacation, it would you know let you know if you there was a, an incident. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you catch a leak right away, you're just mopping up a puddle in your in your bathroom as opposed to dealing with three stories worth of damage. So very true. Yeah. Exactly. Can can make a big difference. Um, we are running more and more uh, recently into homes that um, there is some mold in the attic or there maybe has been previous mold remediation and there's some paperwork on that. Um, and the other areas where I'll see mold as far as uh, in our real estate sales or sometimes bank owned properties um, that had had, you know, frozen pipe damage because they were vacant. And, and, you know, we go in there and there's a bunch of drywall removed and, and maybe a white foamy spray. Um, so, so talk to us about, about mold um, and indoor air quality in homes. Sure. So um, kind of uh, what we were talking about just a moment ago, mold really uh, happens because of moisture uh, or elevated humidity. So, you know, we frequently get calls uh, not only because of attic mold, which I'll talk about in a second, but um, the basements as well, because those tend to be subgrade. Uh, not everyone runs dehumidification, which we strongly advocate for um, installing a self-draining dehumidifier, mm -hmm. set it for between 35 and 50% relative humidity, okay. and just let it do its thing. If the, if the humidity is within that threshold, it's not going to run. Um, but I hear it all the time, well, I only run it during the summer. Well, mold knows no season if the temperature is right and the humidity is there, it will grow. So by, by maintaining a good relative humidity, um, you decrease the risk of, of mold, whether it be in the basement, even um, you know the, the moisture will transmit from the lower level up into the living level. So if you're able to keep the basement dry, chances are the living level is gonna be a little bit more dry. Um, talking about attics, as I mentioned earlier, when we go out and, and look at an attic, we want to diagnose why that mold occurred in the first place. Is it poor ventilation? Is it improper insulation or not enough insulation? Is there a bathroom fan that's blowing directly into the attic, which happens more than you would think? Very um, common. Super yeah. common. Yeah. So every time someone takes a shower, they just introduced almost 100% humidity into an attic space. Mold um, likes organic things that it can break down. So that's going to be the wood uh, up, up in the attic. And uh, so we also want to look at the ventilation. I have seen homes that have no insulation at all in the attic space, but did not have mold growth. But And the reason why was they had so much ventilation. Right. The only detriment to the house was they were spending a ton of money heating the place. There was no yeah. mold. So right. the trade-off really becomes uh, ven ventilation versus cost savings with, with heating. So every now and then someone will say to me, well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to go up there and, and put some bleach on it. So, um, the chlorine molecule, I hear that frequently as well. Of course uh, you do, yeah. You'll, you will get rid of that discoloration uh, for a, a temporary period of time. One of the, if, if someone's not looking at why the issue occurred in the first place, chances are, you know, this is someone that just wants a simple, easy, quote unquote, solution. Um, so they're going to spray some uh, bleach on it to make it disappear. But at the same time, they don't fix the reason why it occurred in the first place. Um, the mold will return because those conditions still exist. And depending on the type of material, that chlorine molecule may actually be too large to get deep into the wood and kill its root system. So the root system still there, the conditions return, mold regrows. So um, bleach has its purpose. If it's a solid surface, a non-porous surface, bleach will work just fine. Um, some of the products we use are like an industrial grade hydrogen peroxide, much smaller molecule. Um, and obviously fixing the reason why the mold occurred in the first place. We also uh, apply sealants after the remediation has been done. 
predominantly in an attic because it's not living space. No one really goes up there very often. We want to give that wood a defense mechanism. So it's it's like putting polyurethane on your floors. You know, you do that to protect the floors. This is a defense mechanism for the wood that's up in the attic. Hmm. So when when mold first started becoming aware to the public about air quality in houses, um, I can remember for maybe one to three years, home inspector or buyer would say, oh, I see some discoloration. Um, nobody says now I see mold. They're, they're always very careful to say discoloration because without the test, you don't know. And then we would run a test. and I get like three pages of all these different types of, of fungus and mold. And the bottom line was it, it didn't really matter which one it was because different people are allergic or sensitive to different ones. Um, and so after a while, the testing doesn't, doesn't seem to be done anymore in residential, at least that I can tell. If we see discoloration, we just call, we, I just call you and we come in and have it treated. Sure. So um, the testing that you're you're talking about, there are certain molds that we um, don't want to see in our uh, inside environments. And those are the ones, you know, I get calls daily that someone says, um, geez, I just had a home inspection and the home inspector found black mold in my attic. Well, it's true that it's black in color, but it's not black mold in in my world, because black mold is what's called stachybotrys. Uh, that forms typically on a paper product like drywall that's had 100% water saturation for an extended period of time. Um, the mold that they're talking about in the attic tends to be one called cladosporium, which is an allergen, not a toxic mold like uh, stachybotrys. Um, but in an elevated state, it still um, can uh, be detrimental to, to one's health, especially if they have asthma. Um, one that I see often in bank-owned properties, just because there's no air movement, uh, you'll get high relative humidity conditions in there. And there's one called Aspergillus penicillium. Um, folks with Lyme disease tend to react um, more quickly to aspergillus penicillium. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if you go into a home, if you have a client that's going into a home and it's been vacant for an extended period of time and they, you know, uh, start to get, you know, I'm just going to say like hay fever type symptoms or, or headaches, chances are it's just because the house uh, has, has sat for a while. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that there's a massive remediation that needs to uh, occur. It could just be a cursory cleaning and again, loving the house and, uh, and all will be fine. But testing does have its, have its place, especially if there's no visible signs of mold, but people are reacting. Um, so it's, it's all about knowledge really. And um, when you go in to remediate, say an attic. So once you've, once you've looked at increasing ventilation, I mean, we know mold needs food and water. So it needs an organic material like a wood or a paper. Um, and then it needs, it needs water. So you usually increase ventilation, but then what's your next steps as far as you mentioned the, um, the industrial strength um, chemicals that you use and some sealant, but about how long does it take? Yeah, so the so the average product uh, project, uh, just to talk about an attic uh, as an example. Typically, we'll go in and we'll set up some containment barriers because we don't. When we're doing the work, we don't want any cross contamination into other areas of the home. Um, depending on uh, how discolored it is or how much mold growth there is up there, we'll, we have several different remediation techniques we can use. The most economical is a chemical treatment solution. Um, then it would be some sort of abrasive, whether it's dry ice blasting, if, uh, if, if necessary. Worst case scenario, um, we say it's in your best interest really just to tear the roof and shingles off and uh, install new plywood. It would be less expensive in, in some circumstances, especially if the shingles are at the end of their functional life. Why spend 
money on a, on remediation when it may be better just to, to tear the roof off, fix the reason why it occurred. Um, talking about the, so, so we'll, we'll, we'll say it's a mild case of mold and we can use a chemical treatment approach. Typically takes one day on average. Um, we'll let the uh, solutions dry. Uh, if it's in the summertime, usually only one day, and then we'll return and apply the uh, encapsulants uh, the, the following day. We always try to use a clear encapsulant. It goes on white, but it dries clear. Um, we try to avoid white because uh, people always assume that you're trying to hide something, and you never want okay, that yeah. in your yeah. you know, future home inspections. What what is this owner trying to hide? So if uh, you can explain, hey, uh, we bought this house and the bathroom fan was venting directly into the attic. We had it treated. We had it sealed. You can you can see the sealer. You can see that the wood underneath is clean. Yes, we have identified that there was an issue, but we've taken corrective action. It makes it, it makes the selling process a lot easier. And you usually provide some type of a, a warranty as well, don't you? That's right. So we will provide everyone uh, a letter of completion, essentially stating what we saw when we got there initially, the treatment steps that we did, recommendations to reduce the risk of future growth, um, the, the products that we use, the manufacturers actually back up their products with a 10-year transferable warranty. So it actually goes with the house, not the owner. Um, there are some steps that the owners need to, to do, and that is to make sure that the condition that created the mold in the first place has been fixed. Um, sealers are not spray it and forget it type products. You can't just spray on an encapsulant and say problem solved. You have to fix the reason why it occurred in the first place. People do sometimes think that just spraying a, a quote unquote paint on it will eliminate yeah. the problem and it'll never come back. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 a falsehood right there. Um, and I believe also, like if we take a walk out in the woods, or if our puppy uh, takes a walk out in the woods, we're we're oftentimes tracking spores back into the house ourselves, aren't we? Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, we live in an environment that is is full of mold spores. This is why, uh, with the testing, I. I do not like the Petri dishes that you can buy at certain box stores and send those off. Those, those will almost certainly grow a type of mold. If they're not a very scientific uh, study. So uh, if you suspect that you have a problem, get testing by a certified uh, mold investigator. Let them come in, run air samples inside the home, but they also take a sample outside of the home. And the reason why is they know that mold is going to come back in the survey that they're conducting. Mm -hmm. They want to see what the indoor air quality is relative to the outdoor air quality. And that will vary for every given home. So your home would be different than my home and your neighbor's home. So if we just looked at, let's say, three tests were taken in, in those three homes, and we just looked at the data, we would say, well, this house must be unhealthy because of the other two points of data that we have, when in actuality, if uh, an outdoor air sample was taken, my, you know, let's say it was my home, my home may have been cleaner than yours. So it just, it's, <laughs> it's, all, <laughs> it's all relative. Yeah. So, um, so if I were to to have a to-do list of things somebody could do right away, one would be to make sure that your attic is adequately ventilated, two, to maybe put in some moisture alarms, and then three would be to um, to watch for ice dams. What am I, anything else? And make sure that your, your, as we talked about before, that the bathroom fans are going directly into the attic. Yeah, and they're that's going right. Into the and dehumidify, sorry, dehumidify the basement. Yes. Dehumidify yes. the basement. That's right. And I am a big fan of those installed ones with the drain as well. Um, do those start at around like two or three thousand dollars? Is that correct? No, they're not that high. Um, okay. You can you can actually get some five hundred dollar models that will drip into 
uh, a condensate tray, which if someone has a forced hot air system with an air conditioner, chances are they already have a condensate pump available. Right. So they can drip that condensate into that, into that pump. And uh, so 500, a, a really the, the higher end systems do run a thousand to two thousand dollars, but that would be for um, a, a decent size basement, possibly one in which uh, the space is finished. Yeah, and um, if you do have a finished basement, I think it's really important that that it not feel damp and clammy. So I recommend dehumidifiers anyway. And if 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 you have to keep emptying the tray, 500 bucks sounds like a very cheap. Yeah, because ultimately you'll get to a, a situation where you just have forgot about it or and yeah. it stops running. So Yeah, and then it's, then it's not doing anything. So, yeah, that's great. That's great. Well, thank you, Chris. I really thank you for getting real with us about water damage and mold remediation and mold prevention. Prevention being the key, of course. So... Um, we're so glad to anybody who is watching or listening to this episode of Spouses Talking Houses. Please be sure to subscribe, to like, and um, I'd very much like to see your, your feedback. So leave us a review. Thanks again. Have a great day. Music courtesy of the Eric Lindbergh Trio. Please visit his website at www.ericlindbergworld.com. Jennifer and Brian are licensed to practice real estate in New Hampshire and Massachusetts. Brian is also a certified general appraiser in New Hampshire. They are not lawyers, accountants, home inspectors, or therapists. Real estate customs and rules may be different in your area. Each Keller Williams Realty Office is independently owned and operated. The realtor name is trademarked to members of the National Association of Realtors. If you are currently under contract with a real estate agent, this is not intended as a solicitation. Views expressed on this podcast by Jennifer may not be shared by Brian and vice versa, nor are they necessarily the views of Keller Williams Realty. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.